Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. The Six Freedoms of the First Amendment, the Foundation of American Society. They are the most important rights guaranteed by the Constitution. They are the base theme of this channel, and I think they are worth discussing. When our society discusses issues politely, with each side seeking a peaceful solution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well, it's time for some roasted opinions. According to Article I of the Constitution, Congress holds all the legislative power in the U.S. federal government. There are several amendments which specifically mention what Congress may or may not do, and the First Amendment is the most important of these. Establishment, as it is used in this amendment, references something common to most nations at the time of the Constitutional Convention, official state religion. The Founding Fathers descended in part from religious dissidents who emigrated to North America to escape religious persecution, and they would not allow religious persecution to reappear in the form of federal law. Congress cannot name one religion as the official religion of the United States. All religious beliefs, including the belief that religion is a farce, stand equal in the eyes of the federal law. This is not to say that there was no religion nor even a dominant religious tradition in America at the time. Nor is it a guarantee that Americans will be free from religion, because that would violate the second freedom of the First Amendment, the free practice of religion. Every American has the right to believe or not believe as they see fit. In theory, Congress cannot bar religious expression any more than it can bar atheist expression and herein lies the first bone of contention. Can Congress legally bar anything religious from federal venues, or does the prohibition on establishment prevent the government from permitting religious symbols and statements in any official capacity and on public property? The Supreme Court has ruled repeatedly that religious monuments on government property may violate the Establishment Clause. To make these determinations, the Lemon Test was established in response to the 1971 case Lemon v. Kurtzman. Number 1. The statute must have a secular legislative purpose. Number 2. The principal or primary effect of the statute must not advance nor inhibit religion. Number 3. The statute must not result in an excessive government entanglement with religion. So long as the statute does not violate these tenets, the religious display is permitted. This has led to some interesting rulings. The case law is inconsistent, in that the courts are charged in these cases with determining the purpose, effect, and entanglement of the government with respect to religion. Recently, the Supreme Court ruled that the government may not ignore religious objections when determining cases of discrimination and may soon hear arguments about the Peace Cross in Maryland, a memorial to local citizens who died in World War I, which is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and has been maintained by the government since the property was acquired in 1961. The third freedom addresses freedom of speech. Simply put, in America, anyone has the right to say anything so long as it passes a couple of tests. The Brandenburg Test regarding imminent lawless action, the Central Hudson Test regarding commercial speech, the curricular tests regarding school speech, and others. The extent of free speech is very broad in America, with very specific cases in which speech is not protected. Likewise, the fourth freedom grants very similar protections to the press. This is because the media is a powerful agency in limiting government abuses and holding it to account. The media also performs this function regarding the actions of private citizens. In both speech and press freedoms, the limits are based upon causing harm and intent, and the burden of proof lies upon the person attempting to suppress the speech or printed statement. Among the many things protected by these two freedoms are access to public forums, anonymity, obscenity, and even false statements. Protection is also provided against compulsory speech, 
and the government also has a right to protected speech. These protections have also been extrapolated to include freedom of expression, in which many other unspoken and unwritten statements are also considered to be protected. The fifth freedom, the right to peaceful assembly, means that Americans can gather together even if that purpose is to protest. The primary test is that the assembly must be made for peaceful purposes and remain peaceful. Merely protesting does not violate peaceful intent in and of itself. In the wake of Berkeley and Charlotte, we must keep in mind that showing up to protest a speech is just as protected as showing up to attend a speech in support. The sixth freedom, the right to petition for redress of grievances, is why the right to peaceful assembly is specifically protected. While protections are specifically addressed to the government, they also apply to gathering outside a private organization to protest. So long as the assembly does not violate private property or create a hazard, the government has no authority to prevent this assembly. There are even corollaries which preserve the right to association and the right to privacy as necessary extensions of both peaceful assembly and petition. The government cannot regulate what organization you belong to, nor can they intrude upon your private life. So, do all these freedoms protect what we say from scrutiny? Um, no. Just, no. These freedoms do not grant a protection from the consequences of what we say, whether for good or for ill. The same freedoms which guarantee someone the right to speak out guarantee the right to respond. Again, insofar as the response does not violate one of the specific tests devised for protected speech. Congress cannot pass a law that would either prevent or compel responses. Our right to argue and name call is protected even when completely unproductive. Unlike other nations, hate speech is narrowly defined as fighting words under the Chaplinsky Doctrine. And unless the statement violates the Brandenburg Test, it is constitutionally protected. Still, that applies to both parties in a dispute. One person has as much right to revile the other. When a person says something deeply offensive, they should expect to face a backlash. Still, I think that it's important that we continue to stand up against those who are perpetually offended. Their histrionic responses to practically everything rise to the level of censorship and even compelled speech, actions against which there are protections under the First Amendment. Deplatforming is a despicable practice and largely unnecessary given the fact that the response is also free speech. Bringing offensive things to light in the public forum is the best way to identify and discuss these things. At the end of every episode, I say that you don't have to agree with me. And I truly mean that. You don't have to agree with me. But I still think it's important for us to be having discussions about the issues that we face these days. Now that's just my opinion, and you don't have to agree with it. In fact, I'd love to hear what you think, so leave a comment below. If you like what I have to say, push the button and ring the bell. New videos come out every Saturday at noon central, so watch this space. Tune in to my live streams at the end of every month and sit down with me in the kitchen.